All right, this is chapter 20, Regeneration, part five of the book of uh, Bible, Bible Doctrine, which is an annotated version of uh, Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology. We're on chapter 20. Um, so here's where it fits in with the rest of the chapters. And you can see that we have already covered uh, the Word of God. Why is it authoritative? And uh, what does it teach us about who God is, who man is, our relationship to God, and our need for Christ? Now we're on the section where it's, it's called the doctrine of the application of redemption. How is it that our right relationship, our redemption into a, back into a right relationship with God is applied to our lives? And I've already talked about common grace, how uh, everybody has an opportunity to believe based on just the fact of existence. We know there's a creator because of the creation. Talked about election, how God has chosen us from time, uh, from before time began, um, but yet we, he, he has a means of bringing us to salvation. Um, the gospel call is absolutely necessary. We need to hear the gospel. God works that out, uh, and we are meant to share it, even though uh, we know that God has elected certain people to believe. We have the assurance that some people will respond to the gospel. So now we're on the section called regeneration. And so to regenerate means uh, to come to new life. Uh, and uh, we just have one question. What does it mean to be born again? So we can define regeneration as follows. Regeneration is a secret act of God in which he imparts new spiritual life to us. This is sometimes called being born again. So I know that phrase, if you're as old as me, you know that it has been well used back in the 70s uh, with the Jimmy Carter era, him saying he was born again, and uh, people uh, maybe overusing that term and maybe uh, attaching a lot of baggage to it. But it is a very biblical term, and we'll be talking a lot about uh, regeneration in those terms. Um, so the, the term comes from John chapter 3. Uh, three through eight. So but we're going to find out that regeneration is totally a work of God. Um, it's not something you can't go back in the womb and decide to be born. None of us decided to be born. It was something that kind of happened to us. It was uh, something we look back on as an event in our lives that was totally beyond our control. So uh, just uh, it's a great um, being born again spiritually and uh, kind of connecting it to our physical birth is a great, I believe, a great analogy that John uses and is used in other parts of scripture. So our first verse we're going to look at today is John chapter 1, 12 through 13. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent. And that would be referring to um, the Jews being born into the Jewish nation. So it wasn't that they were born into it, uh, and it, it doesn't come about by our heredity, it doesn't come about by our decisions or even our parents' decisions, but we are born of God. So it's, um, it's taking away our own works, our own decision-making, our parents' decision-making, and our genealogy and saying, no, this is something that is totally in God's control. James 1, 18, he chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. So James, the half-brother of Jesus, referred to it as a sort of birth, spiritual birth. And First Peter 1, 3, Peter says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So I want to go into the uh, passage where Jesus really talks about being born again. I, 
it, it's a little bit longer, but I think it's really worth it to show that it's something that's totally beyond our control. Uh, he had a man, Nicodemus, who came to him, if you remember, in the middle of the night saying, what must I do to be saved? Um, and uh, Jesus replied very true. First, first of all, he said, you're a teacher of Israel and you don't know? Like it, sh like it should be something they should know. But he said, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked, taking it literally and saying, you know, thinking about physical birth. And Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Uh, now, this water and the spirit, the water term is a little uh, controversial. Some some thinkers, Bible scholars, believe it means maybe a reference to our physical birth. I've always assumed that. Uh, others believe that uh, it uh, comes from a, a chapter or passage from the Old Testament from the book of Ezekiel, which I'll read in a minute. Uh, but he said, uh, you may need to be born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. So who caused it? Who caused the wind? And what's the bigger plan here? We just see a small snippet of uh, the wind in action, and we just see a small snippet of God's work in action. And uh, we see our part in it, but we don't uh, see the context of where it fits in. So it's a work of God. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. And so this is the verse that uh, Jesus may have been referring to. He was very familiar with the um, Old Testament. And uh, so Ezekiel 36, 26 through 27 reads, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and to be careful to keep my laws. So I really believe that this is referring to, you know, when we say invite Jesus into your heart, really what what is happening is the Holy Spirit is coming to take up residence within us rather than affecting us from the outside as he does do through even in the lives of non-believers. He has an impact and effect on, you know, on, on them. We live in a world that's not all evil. It's, ha you know, maybe halfway good, halfway evil. And, uh, uh, but, uh, but that's because we're influenced by godly people and by God's word and by all the influence of God's word on civilization. So um, we're influenced from the outside by the Holy Spirit. But when we're regenerated, when we're born again, he comes to take up residence in us. So now we're going to go on to uh, just a, a little bit of an understanding of about um, where does, you know, who is it that's working in our lives in the work of regeneration? And it's a work of all three persons of the Trinity. So we have various uh, passages that talk about who is it exactly uh, that's doing this work? So John 3, 8, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound. I just read this. You can't tell where it comes from. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Ephesians 2, 5, he made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace you've been saved. So it's a work of the Holy Spirit. It's a work of Christ. Colossians 2.13, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. So it's a work through Christ. James 1, 17 to 18, every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. So again, um, here now we have God the Father is uh, the one through whom this work is done. And 1 Peter 1, 3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So now part three, we want to talk about 
an effective call and, and regeneration. In other words, we hear the gospel call, which we talked about last week, and uh, and there's controversy over, you know, are we regenerated and we hear the call? Do we respond to the call? What What uh, is the relationship between us being born again and having heard the gospel message? And um, so 1 Peter 2 or 1, 23 says, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. So um, it's, it's a result of having heard. This is, this is not necessarily that God needs us to hear the word of God, but he chooses. This is his, um, this is his method. This is his means of applying the, uh, the redemption that we can experience as Christians, is that God uses his word preached to us or shared with us somehow, whether it's in written form or spoken form. Um, but God's word has an effect on those who have God has called with the gospel, and he chooses to work through that. First Peter 1.25, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. So again, through the preaching. James 1.18, he chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. So we're talking about that spiritual birth. We're talking about the three parts of the Trinity. But now we're also talking about a fourth element, and that would be the, um, the word of God and, and its effect in our lives. So Acts 10.44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on those who heard the message. So sometimes it's hard to differentiate between people hearing the message and responding. Um, sometimes it can be instantaneous like this. Their hearts were cut to the quick. They were, their hearts were warmed, as John Wesley would say. But uh, um, why is that? Uh, it's irresistible in those whom God has effectively called. Um, and so we have a term, it's a theological term, um, used to describe those effects. It's called irresistible grace. And um, what that's saying is that those whom God has chosen uh, can't resist. He, he gives us the desires of our hearts. He brings us to faith and, and repentance. Sometimes. We might be struggling, but he brings us. Um, and, uh, uh, and so it just describes the effects of the gospel call and regeneration, both of which are acts of God alone and guarantee that we'll respond in saving faith. So this is the part, I think, of, of our faith that really takes some hard lessons oftentimes or some very consistent preaching to get it through maybe our thick skulls is that we didn't come to Christ of our own accord, but that he drew us to himself. Um, uh, and, um, and so it's a mystery exactly how that works. Uh, it's not meant to downplay human responsibility at all in responding to the gospel. So we still call people to respond. That's part of the gospel call that I went over last week, but um, it's a, uh, it's a combination of God's call, the gospel call, and the preaching of his word, and uh, um, just uh, the, the bringing of new life where we were once dead, spiritual life, which is what regeneration is. So the exact nature of regeneration is mysterious to us, um, but what we do know is that once we were dead, and now we are alive, uh, in a spiritual sense. Um, so Ephesians 2.1, uh, there's many references to death and life in, re return in, in terms of regeneration. Ephesians 2.1 says, as for you, you were dead in your trespasses, transgressions, I'm sorry, and sins. John 3.3, 3, Jesus replied, very truly, I can tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again into that spiritual life. John 3.7, you should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. So uh, once we were dead, we become born again, and now we're alive. Ephesians 2.5, he made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. 
It is by grace you have been saved. So just an, an emphasis on who we were before we were redeemed or uh, regenerated. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. Physically alive, just as um, Adam, God said to Adam that you, on the day you eat of this fruit, the day you disobey me, you will die. And he didn't die. God didn't lie. Spiritually, he, he was dead uh, on that day. Um, so, uh, you know, people, I don't want to say that we're zombies <laughs> or this is the night of the living dead. But we're physically, people can walk around and be physically alive, but spiritually dead. And that's what we were before we um, were born again into Christ. So uh, Ephesians, or I'm sorry, Colossians 2.13 says, When you were dead in your sins and in the circum uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ from death to life. He forgave us all our sins. and. Um, you know, for many, uh, many people experience this as a one-time event, and that is what it is. It's something that happens very quickly. The changes, the the um, uh, sanctification, the the habit change, the lifestyle change, that doesn't happen immediately. And a lot of times, Christians are uh, new Christians are are criticized by the world because they claim that they have a new life and yet they continue on in many of their old sins. So that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about something that happens mysteriously, something that happens secretively. It's a new life. It's kind of like, I guess, birth uh, when uh, a baby is conceived. We don't know that there's life there, but it's already got all the DNA. It's already a human being. It's 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 begun, even though we don't even know that uh, the mother is pregnant. In the same way, God has put new life, regenerated a, a believer, and uh, worked in a secret way that we can't really see the outward signs of uh, immediately. Sometimes, though, it's very dramatic. It's usually most dramatic in adult, hardened sinners, we'll call them, often less dramatic in those raised in a godly household. Why? Because if you've ra been raised in a godly household, you have a lot more habits, a lot more lifestyle, uh, a, a, a more godly lifestyle, and um, the changes is not are not all that dramatic. Uh, it becomes evident over time in the patterns of behavior and desires, including but not limited to, and these are all most of these drawn from First John, uh, which I believe is an excellent. Uh, epistle to read for those of us who maybe come to a point where we question our salvation, we, we need reassurance that we are indeed saved. Um, at the end of his epistle, he says, these things I've written so that you can know that you have eternal life. And what are these things? Well, a lot of them are mentioned here. Others are mentioned in other parts of the Bible. But just in general, uh, a heartfelt trusting in Christ for salvation and uh, self-awareness of belief and assurance of sins forgiven. So this is, you know, the more we realize that our forgiveness comes not from our own efforts, but from Christ and from what Christ did on the cross, the more assurance we'll have. And so we mature in that understanding that this is not something I have to keep working on. It's a gift and uh, we need to accept it and receive it. So uh, as, you know, over time, we become more assured of our salvation. We want to read the Bible uh, and to pray. It's not something we shy away from, even though it's hard work and even though there will be dry times. We know, we sense over time that um, the more we are into God's word, the more it'll get into us and uh, we allow it to affect our prayers. We, we pray, we read the Bible prayer, prayerfully, and we develop that two-way communication with God, uh, two-way relationship. We delight in worshiping God. Um, I remember there was a time when uh, I felt very self-conscious about uh, raising my hands, for example, or even closing my eyes and praying. Um, you know, what am I praying to the thin air? Sometimes I, th I thought, and then other times I realized, no, I'm worshiping God and I'm praying to God. And he's here and he's listening. We have a desire for Christian fellowship. We want to spend more time with God's people, not get away from them, but 
to be with them more. We have a sincere desire to be obedient, so obedient to God's word as we read it in Scripture. And we have a desire to tell others about Christ. Now, what I've found in my life was um, <clears throat> for many years I had a strong desire to want to share my faith uh, ever since I became a Christian, but I didn't know how to do it. And so having the desire and actually following through and doing it are two different things. And um, so a lot of Christians do not, prob uh, well, it's been shown, the majority of Christians do not share their faith on a regular basis. Um, but if we have the Spirit of the Lord living within us, we have a desire to do so. Now, if you have that desire and you don't follow through with it, what that leads to is frustration. And uh, <clears throat> we have the Holy Spirit living within us, wanting to get out, wanting to express himself, wanting to glorify God and proclaim him to others, and yet not, and yet us not physically or socially maybe knowing how to do it. How do we get that word across? And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, so for many years I was living in, in a lot of frustration with um, just trying to come up with all sorts of fancy ways to share the gospel. And um, uh, finally realizing I just need to go talk to people. Uh, and uh, there are ways that we can do it without, um, um, you know, in a tactful way, in a way that is a, a good ambassador for the Lord. So, but everyone who is born again will have that desire to share their faith. So, um, in the sense of generation, regeneration, it comes before saving faith. So just to talk again about a little bit about the order of salvation, we have election, God, before time began choosing us. We have the gospel call. So we hear, as non-believers, we hear the gospel. It's shared with us in different forms. Um, and then we might say, well, okay, well, then what happens? We believe and then we're regenerated, uh, or are we regenerated and then believe? Well, biblically speaking, we believe that uh, it's regeneration is, that, uh, is what gives us the ability to believe. And so it must come first, even though they may be fairly instantaneous uh, or simultaneous. So Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Um, and the reason I'm tying this and repeating this from uh, earlier is this phrase, unless one is born of the water, Grudem believes that it's referring to this passage from Ezekiel and about sprinkling clear water on us, clean water on us. And uh, um, it's part of the response of faith. And so, Faith and repentance, repentance and faith, they go hand in hand. Um, what does the, the clean water, it symbolizes, what does it mean? It symbolizes our being cleaned or cleansed from our sins through repentance. Um, so that's why he's uh, referring to this. He believes that uh, um, when Jesus says you need to be born of the water and the spirit, the spirit gives us belief the spirit gives us the ability to have saving faith the water is a representative of the repentance that also comes with regeneration john 6 44 no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws them and i will raise them up on the last day so we don't come to faith by our own efforts somehow will ourselves to faith i think there's a lot of non-christians who would like to believe i've met many who say they want to believe but they just can't and uh, I appreciate their honesty, you know. Um, and it may be that they have not yet been drawn. And my, I still have hope for them because God could do that at any point in their life. I take the uh, role of the one who proclaims the gospel, gives them the gospel call. Whether it's of God or of me, I don't know uh, whether God's going to use that in an in effective calling. But um, what I do know is that they can't, I, I have explained, I have spent long periods of time to very willing listeners who had good questions and were really engaged and I believe came to a good understanding of the gospel and uh, they still didn't respond in faith. 
Why? Because I don't believe it was their time. God was not drawing them or calling them at that time. He may have given them information that they can later act upon. And uh, it may be something that's just there to humble me. And they might, might have become a Christian the minute I left their presence. And I never knew. So uh, I have that hope. Um, but uh, uh, I, I just trust that it's not my persuasive powers uh, in people's lives, but it's God working in them and drawing them to himself. Acts 16, 14 is another example of this, how it works in God's in uh, people's lives. Uh, one of those listening to Paul as he was preaching was a woman from the city of Tyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. So she was already in the habit of worshiping God. She had a general revelation of that there is a creator and she was great, had gratitude and grateful and in her heart and wanted to worship God as her, I guess you'd say, higher power. But she really didn't know him personally. And then it says, the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. So she had responded to the general revelation. She was already a, you guess you could say, a God-fearing woman. But until she heard that specific gospel call that, went, that came through Paul, uh, and the Lord opened her heart, that's the key. So. In contrast to the carnal mindset, the worldly mindset, um, so uh, 1 Corinthians 2.14 tells us, the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness. So just like I was saying, I think I've explained things very clearly to people, but the, it still it becomes foolish and Either they understand me at the time, and the minute they walk away, they're distracted by the things of the world, as described in the parable of the seed and the, the soils, or something else, but uh, they're filled with, um, they just can't understand. It says, and they cannot understand the things of God because they are uh, discerned only through the Spirit. So it's only by the Spirit of God that we come to Christ, and it's only by the Spirit of God that we can um, understand his word. Ephesians 2, 4 to 5 says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace you've been saved. I think maybe one of the best ways to keep remembering that we were brought to life by Christ and not that we came to life by our own, um, you know, that we were born again by our own decision, is just to say that we were dead and dead people cannot make decisions. Dead people can't decide to be born. Um, it's not something we can will ourselves to do. So if we can get it through our heads that sin through sin, we were dead in our sins. Um, a good analogy for me uh, is the story of Lazarus, um, who died and was put in the grave, and he was spirit, well, spiritually, he was physically dead, and Jesus came, opened the grave, and said, Lazarus, come out, and Lazarus came to life. Lazarus didn't, he was dead. He didn't will himself to live. Um, and he, I imagine he lay there and probably wondered, where am I? And all of a sudden, there's this light that blinded him. Um, he'd already started to rot, so he must have miraculously come to, uh, you know, to, uh, to good health again. Um, but he hears Jesus calling, and he gets up, and uh, and he walks towards the light, right? Well, he didn't wake himself up, but he did decide to get up and walk toward Jesus. Now, if he had decided not to get up, well, he could lay there all the time he wants uh, in that stinky grave, but um, it's just a matter of time before he says, you know what, I'm hungry. I'm going to go get something to eat. He, he, he didn't wake himself up. It was a, it was a work of God. But as far as us progressing in our relationship with God and in our faith, it's only a matter of time. We might as well just go ahead and cooperate with God and, um, um, you know, get up and get out of the grave and, and start to live our life in Christ. Amen. So regeneration comes before life change, including saving faith. Now, this is 
source of controversy in Christianity, mainly because it's not defined the same way. So some within Christianity define regeneration or maybe being born again in terms of the total life change that results from the reception of saving faith. So I've met a lot of people in the South I've heard or, or who have come from the South who say, yeah, I'm born again. And what they're really referring to is, yeah, I, I, I changed my life. I repented. I, I had a life change. And then they say I was born again a few years later and I was born again. And so we start to get the sense that they're not talking about that initial regeneration, but they're talking about a life change. Which And then I fell back into, they say, um, uh, I became carnal again, or I, I backslid, they'll say. So that's different, and that's a different term, uh, a different way to use the term. So, so in that sense, they'd be correct to say that it follows saving faith. However, this wouldn't be a biblical def definition. So what we're talking about is, the regeneration that brings us from death to life and results in saving faith, and results in repentance and life change. So it's the initial, and that's a key word, the initial, the first work of God in which he imparts spiritual life to us. We can emphasize that we do not see generation, regeneration itself, but we only see the results of it in our lives. And that faith in Christ for salvation is the first result that we see. So Philippians uh, 1 6 says, being confident in this, that he who began, key word, he began the good work in us, will carry it to completion in the day of Jesus Christ. Okay, moving on. Genu genuine regeneration must bring results in life. Um, and uh, I would emphasize that word must. It must bring. So um, people can change a certain amount on their own, uh, to, by their own efforts. But uh, so just because you see uh, godly results in someone's life does not necessarily mean they've been born again, or regenerated. Um, everyone's dealt a different hand of cards, and some people come from a very uh, difficult background. Uh, we can't walk into a church and expect uh, everyone in the church to be better than the you know, the best atheist that we know, um, we all come from a different place. And, uh, and yet, there needs to be some kind of change. There are um, verses in the Bible that refer to uh, progress, that refer to, you know, that you are changing, that your faith is growing, your, your godliness is growing. So what are the areas in which uh, those changes occur? Well, godly, the main one is character, our godly character. And faith is a part of character. First um, John 5, 1 John 5.1 says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. Emphasis there on believing, having faith in Jesus, um, is definitely an indication of, uh, of, of faith and of regeneration. Um, the devil believes that Jesus is the Son of God, yet he doesn't have any of these other character traits. So it, this would not be the only thing um, that is an indication, not that brings salvation, saving faith, regeneration, but is an indication that it's already happened, is what we're talking about here. So repentance would be another one. First John 3, 9, no one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them, they cannot go on sinning because they've been born of God. This doesn't mean uh, they don't sin on occasion, but uh, it's referring to a lifestyle of habitual sin, people just throwing themselves into sin. No, we have the Holy Spirit within us who is steadily working on us, sanctifying us, bringing about godly character that results in less and less sin as time goes on. 1 John 2.29 is if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. So it's not just that we avoid sin, but it's also doing what there are the right things that we should do. And I think the best, some of the best advice that I can say about how to deal with sin is to have, make sure you have something to replace it with. It's not just about repenting and turning from our sin because it's going to leave gaps in our life. Uh, 
that need to be filled. And, um, you know, idleness is, is, uh, something that the devil uses. I forget the, the phrase there or the, the saying, but, uh, devil's workshop, I guess it is. Um, but Jesus counsels, you know, I, I think the story, the, his parable of the, when the spirit leaves a man and, and, uh, and then comes back and finds everything, you know, cleaned and put in order. Uh, it doesn't talk about him replacing that spirit with the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so the, so the spirit comes back and finds, you know, brings, invites many more spirits to come and live with him because um, we need those spaces in our life to be filled with serving God in a positive sense and not just avoiding sin in a negative sense. So um, we also will be filled with a Christ-like love. First John 4, 7 says, Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who has been born of God uh, and knows God, or everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. So we'll also find ourselves uh, finding uh, the strength to overcome Satan and world, just the whole world system, the temptations of the world, uh, worldliness. First John 5, 3 to 4 says, In fact, this is love for God to keep his commands, and his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. So over to the ability to, I guess the way I think about it is the ability to swim upstream against the current. When everyone else is going downstream, you are one of those few people who are swimming against the current of this worldly culture around us and able to um, make headway against it. And we can only do that with the strength that, well, we can do it for a brief amount of time, but we can only do it uh, consistently and growing uh, in our faith, I I through faith in Christ and with through Christ's help. First John 5.18 says, We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who was born of God keeps them safe, and the evil one cannot harm him. I admit, uh, the Bible says we are not as strong as the devil. He is a much higher, much more powerful being. But us, plus the Father's strength, can overcome the evil one. On our own, we don't stand a chance. But uh, we are not on our own once we have been born again. 1 John 4.4, 4, You dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. So uh, we have the ability to overcome uh, the world, the flesh, and the devil uh, through faith in Christ. Um, and it's an, it's an increasing ability. Um, being uh, uh, regenerated brings about around necessary changes. It will result. Uh, faith and character change will result. So all of these changes I'm talking about are, are evidence, they're clues uh, that you have been saved. Uh, a person can't be born again. If you don't see these things happening in your life over time, we're all going to go through seasons where we uh, maybe even take some steps backwards. But over time, if the trajectory isn't towards greater godliness and uh, um, uh, sanctification, then um, then it is time to struggle and wrestle with our faith uh, and ask ourselves some hard questions. Or if we're dealing with a loved one or someone we're, say, discipling or someone we know and they claim to be born again, well, where's the evidence? What's the fruit of that? For we, But um, we are made for good works, that we're not saved by good works. We're made for good works, uh, for we are first. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, Ephesians uh, two eight to ten, two eight and nine really talks about the fact that we're saved by grace through faith. We need to also look though at verse ten because it's a natural result. It's the evidence. It's the clues that what happened in in verses eight and nine uh, actually uh, meant something. So. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are 
God's handiwork created in Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So um, the good works are important. Don't get me wrong. That's not what saves us, but it's evidence that we are saved. What are some of the, what what is some of the, this fruit of the spirit I was talking about? Um, well, it's character traits. Galatians five twenty two to twenty three really lists them. Uh, notice what they are. They're not doing great miracles. They're not uh, uh, you know getting great degrees or attaining positions of leadership in the church. It's nothing like that. It's what is your character? So it says the fruit of the spirit is love joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against such things there is no law. Um, and uh, as in contrary, in contrast, Matthew seven fifteen to 20 says, watch, Jesus was saying, watch out for false prophets. Um, how will you know them? They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Well, what kind of fruit would that be? Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Uh, likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, those, those uh, different character traits, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Um, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree can't bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. So it's important to say that uh, just as good character is evidence that we are saved, bad character, especially as it continues or even gets worse, is an evidence that we're not, that we're not regenerated or born again. And we shouldn't just automatically think that people who uh, do great, wonderful things, maybe on TV, are saved. Uh, they might be, very easily could be false prophets. So if you look at any time the Bible mentions the fruit of the Spirit, it's not referring to um, necessarily to church activity or miracles. So all of the things we see about speaking in tongues, about performing miracles, about prophesying, um, that's not necessarily evidence that a person is uh, growing in sanctification and holiness. Uh, it's, not, it's, it's not mentioned as fruit of the Spirit. So Jesus warned uh, about this. Uh, many people will come. Notice the, the very religious sounding things, the miraculous type things, the power over demons that, that some people can um, demonstrate. And yet he says, I never knew you, depart from me. So he said, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell you plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. So, um, so it's important uh, you know, to realize that regeneration and being born again will result in changes in our lives but it's not necessarily um, always the changes that we might be looking for. It's character changes. It's, it's uh, godliness, holiness, being sanctified, which means to be made holy and set apart from the world. So a um, big part of our faith is this regeneration. Many of us who have grown up in Christian households may not have seen it or experienced it in a uh, in a dramatic fashion. Um, some of you probably know someone or some of you may be someone who has come to Christ, uh, experienced being born again in a very sudden, revolutionary type of way. And, uh, um, and so that's, it's very real. And it, that is what is happening in people's lives. So uh, it's a part of the process uh, of of, um, you know, becoming a saved Christian, becoming a part of the family of God. This one and the one right before it, the gospel call, uh, are beyond our control. They are, um, they are gifts of God. 
they're not something that we participate in. Um, from now, you know, the next few chapters will be more things that we do have control over and, uh, uh, you know, God will use these coming chapters, the things that we learn about as a way to hold us responsible uh, for our own growth in, as Christians. Uh, we didn't save ourselves. We didn't cause ourselves to be born into this world. But uh, we sure don't want to grow up to be uh, adult, in name only, Christian babies uh, who are acting like, you know, we can't even walk when we should be running. And uh, we don't want to, no one, no one likes to see a, a grown kid acting like a little baby uh, or even a grown adult acting like a little baby. And uh, so that's what we'll be moving on to. Okay. So that is the end of chapter 20. We'll see you next week.